Hello and welcome to my video on flying in Canada where I'll share some of the things that I've learned about the differences between flying in Canada and the United States in a general aviation context. I'm James Sloan, a professional pilot and flight instructor based in California. And on this channel, I share some of the lessons I've learned from my over 20 years of flying experience, both in professional aviation and general aviation. I made this video in particular because a club that I'm part of here in California recently took a trip to Canada. And while I was preparing for that trip, I found it a little bit difficult to find information that I could easily consume about how to fly in Canada, about some of the regulatory differences and procedural differences of flying there, as well as some of the border crossing formalities. So that's what we'll be covering in this video. Specifically, I'll share some of the resources that I use to understand those differences. I'll share detail on the border crossing procedures and formalities, and of course the required documents for that crossing, as well as the required documents just for operating in Canada. We'll talk about aeronautical charts, which are a little bit different, and in particular airspace, which is different and is depicted differently on the charts. And then we'll talk about air traffic control communications and how that interacts with airspace, because that is also a little bit different. And then lastly, we'll just talk about a couple of other one-off but important differences between flying in Canada and flying in the U.S. I do want to add a disclaimer that this presentation is based on my experience flying in a Part 91 context under day VFR in Canada. There are some differences with IFR flying as well. We didn't have a chance to do any IFR flying, so you would need to research that on your own. But this will cover some of the differences for day VFR flying, and it's really intended to help U.S.-based pilots understand the differences of flying in Canada. I'm not that familiar with flying in other countries either, so this is pretty U.S.-centric. And it's definitely not intended to be comprehensive and encompass all types of flying that you could do in Canada. You are ultimately responsible for understanding the requirements for your specific type of flight. With that, I will say that flying is a great way to experience the, the beauty of Canada. We were able to fly through the Rocky Mountains on the border of British Columbia and Alberta, and there was some really beautiful mountain flying, and then we flew over to the coast of British Columbia to uh, Vancouver and Victoria, which are beautiful cities situated right on the coast. It's really a beautiful variety of natural scenery, and it is generally very aviation friendly and pretty easy to navigate. There are just some differences that you should know about. So here's some of the resources that I used for this presentation. AOPA, if you are a member, which should be, has a great overview of international travel in general, as well as Canada specifically, and that is a great source. They also have this uh, document that's a little bit of a flyer, but it has a, a couple of checklists on it for border crossing that I found very useful. Transport Canada is Canada's equivalent, if you will, of the FAA. They have this flyer called Flying to Canada that is also geared towards helping international pilots understand flying in Canada. Transport Canada also has an equivalent of the Aeronautical Information Manual, the AIM. That's located here. And then their entire body of regulations is available online, just like the Federal Aviation Regulations are here, and you can find those here. And lastly, for weather information, uh, there's this flight planning navcanada.ca link. I'll put these links in the comments so you can actually click through and follow them. Okay, so one of the major differences is the documents that you need to have when you are acting as the pilot in command. And by this, I mean you are responsible for the flight. Not necessarily the person that's manipulating the controls, but the person on board responsible for the outcome of the flight. That pilot in command needs to have a restricted radio telephone operator permit which is issued by the U.S. Federal Communications Commission. It's a one-time $35 payment. There's a kind of complicated application process, but there's no test or anything like that. And here on the right is what the certificate looks like once you get it, or there's a full-size one and a wallet-size one uh, that looks like this. You need a medical certificate, at least third class, Basic med, which is recognized in the United States, is not recognized in Canada. So you must have an actual medical certificate. Again, this only applies to the pilot acting as the pilot in command, not to other others on, on board. And of course, you need your passport. And in the U.S., we have these passport cards that are accepted in some locations, but they are not accepted for entry into Canada any longer. You need the actual passport booklet in order to uh, cross the border into Canada and back into the U.S. Then the airplane must also have some documents that are a little bit different from those required in the U.S. 
The airplane must also have a radio license, also available from the FCC, also permanent, and it's a one-time $135 payment. Anyone can apply for this. You don't have to be the owner of the aircraft. So in fact, we, in a couple of cases, just acquired them directly for airplanes that we were renting from another owner. You need to have proof of liability insurance that is valid in Canada. And usually your insurer can give you a certificate of insurance that satisfies this requirement. Honestly, no one asked for this, uh, but just in case someone did ask, you are required to have this on board, as well as proof of ownership of the aircraft or proof of permission to use the aircraft. So in our case, most of the aircraft we were using were provided through leaseback with a flight school, so we were not the direct owners, but we had a letter from the club saying we were allowed to use the airplane in Canada. And then lastly, we need a customs decal or the receipt for that decal. Now this one we did get asked for. They did not really care if we had the actual decal, but they wanted us to have the number and so if you apply for this on this website, you pay the $32 fee. It's an annual one, so you need to do this every year. And ideally, you have the actual permit number that you see there on the decal so that you can provide that when you uh, re-enter the United States. When crossing the border, uh, this was probably the most complicated and most stressful part, but it really isn't that hard. It was just because I didn't know the procedure. And so I'm going to just break down what the steps are here. The first is you need to log on to this EAPIS website and file a manifest and notice of departure. You have until up to one hour prior to departure to do this. We all did it the night before, but technically you can do it the day of as long as it's one hour prior to departure. Then you need to file an ICAO DVFR flight plan. Then you need to secure permission to land. And this is slightly different if you're flying into Canada. You just call CanPass at this phone number and they will, they will explain to you what to do when you get to Canada and they will give you permission to land. When you're entering the US, you need to call the specific airport where you will be landing. It must be an airport of entry and you have to find the phone number for customs and call them. We had to call them the day of because it's just you know one guy that lives there locally and will come out to the airport and what if he gets sick uh, you know and so you have to call the day of in in that case anyway and he will tell you that you have permission to land and also give you some information about where to go and what to do when you arrive then when you depart you activate your flight plan it's very similar to activating a VFR flight plan anywhere else but you activate it with flight service in the US at least 15 minutes before you cross the border. Uh, in Canada, air traffic control in Canada can activate flight plans. So when you're coming back, you just make sure that Canadian air traffic control has activated your flight plan. And either way, you must have a squawk code for border crossing. And it won't always be the same squawk code that you'd get for flight following. So in our case, we got a squawk for flight following. And then when we got close to the border, our flight following was terminated we switched to our border crossing code and no longer we're talking to ATC. And it felt really crazy, but that, that is the procedure. And um, you know, we were not greeted with any, um, any F-16s or anything. So uh, it may not be the same squawk. So make sure you're very clear what you should be squawking when you cross the border. And then of course, once you land, you will uh, clear customs and immigration via whatever procedure they give you uh, when they when you call them to secure permission to land one thing they stress is do not leave the airplane wait inside the airplane inside the customs area and the customs officers will approach you and tell you when you can exit the airplane so here's some more detail on this first step the EAPIS process so the first thing you should do is enroll on this website and you can fill out some detail about the crew members in particular you know you if you are the pilot in command you can enter information about yourself and any other required crew members that you're carrying and then up to one hour prior to departure, you have to file this departure manifest and uh, notice of departure. So in this document, you need the passport information and addresses and contact information from all your passengers. You need to identify an airport that is a, that is a departure airport and that is close to the border crossing. So in our case, it was not our actual departure airport. We picked an airport close to the border that was in the list. And if you click the little arrow there, next to the uh, field, it will give you a list of acceptable airports to put here. So we found the nearest airport, 
and we put that and then in the actual departure location we put where we would actually be departing you estimate the time and location of your border crossing and you put that in a, the appropriate field down here and in our case we just used an airport that was right on the border you can also use a, a fix or navigate or or intersection or anything like that and just put the estimated time that you'll cross the border and then you have a 60 minute window within which to cross the border at that location once you submit that you will receive an email and of course there's more detail i didn't put all the screenshots there's more detail on the airplane and the owner information of the airplane so make sure you have that if it's not your airplane make sure you have information on the owner um, most of that is in the in the public faa registry uh, there's at least a name and address in the registry you'll receive an email and you have to make sure that email contains the phrase departure clearance is authorized or something like that if you're coming into the u.s the email will not say that as i said you have to call the airport of entry for that permission but when you're leaving the u.s it'll just say departure is authorized or something like that so read that email if it's not authorized there will be instructions for what to do there's a full tutorial on this too that aopa offers um, it's it's lengthy, but it, it's very detailed. So if you have any questions or, or any concerns about this process, like I said, this was probably the most stressful thing for us was trying to navigate this process. We also found that it didn't work perfectly on all types of browsers. I had some trouble doing this on my iPad with two different browsers and ended up having to use a, uh, a laptop to do it. So you know, make sure that you have a way, have access to one or multiple devices that can actually properly fill out these forms or it will be stressful for you. Okay, so then you need to file a DVFR flight plan. And the good news is this can be done using ForeFlight, and I imagine it can be done using Garmin Pilot, but I don't know. I don't use Garmin Pilot anymore. But it's, it's very similar to filing any other flight plan. You just need to make sure that you select DVFR under Flight Rules. And then in the route, you need to include the fix where you told them you would be crossing the border. Then ForeFlight transmits that information to the flight service station, the flight service station estimates when and where you will penetrate the, uh, the defense zone that it is, and they communicate that to the appropriate authorities. So you don't have to do all of that figuring as long as you put the right information there in the flight plan. Then, as I said, you activate with flight service or with air traffic control in Canada. You get a squawk code for border crossing and just make sure you're clear what code you should be squawking when you cross the border because you may not necessarily be talking to air traffic control when you cross the border. Then on arrival, of course, you have to close the flight plan. And in the U.S., that's done through the flight service station. In Canada, air traffic control can close flight plans for you. And then once you arrive, this will vary by airport, but in general, there is some customs area at airports of entry, and you park the airplane in that area. And in this photo, you can see there's a yellow boundary. That actually just encircles the commercial zone but that white square is the customs area and it was labeled customs area. And the customs people would not come talk to you if you were not parked in that square. So, you know, they're very particular about the procedure. So make sure you clarify that when you call them, but you taxi into that box, you shut down and you wait for them to come out and you don't exit the airplane until they tell you to. And they want to see, they wanted to see our passports and I think maybe pilot's licenses. They didn't ask for a lot of other information. They asked if we were carrying any illicit materials or large amounts of money or that sort of thing. Typical questions you get at, you know, at a commercial airport when you're crossing the border. It was not really that different once we figured out where to go and what to do. Uh, when you're arriving in Canada, sometimes the people will come out, the customs officials will come out and do that, or sometimes you can just do a phone call. Uh, you can call that CanPass phone number, tell them you've arrived, and they may do all of this over the phone. It sort of depends. We were a group of five airplanes, so they had um, they had the officials come out to the airport and meet us since we were all going to arrive close to each other. So moving on, uh, let's talk about some of the differences in airspace in Canada. This is probably the single biggest difference in aviation procedure and and charts and so forth. So I'll try to liken this to the U.S. equivalents. Class A airspace is the same. It's high-level controlled airspace. Class Bravo there, though, they call it here on this chart controlled low-level airspace, but it's not that low level. It starts at 12,500 or higher. It's, it's high-altitude airspace. There are not Class Bravo airports in Canada. So Class Bravo is also an upper-level airspace 
that you need an explicit clearance into. The lower level airspaces that you might be concerned about if you're, if you're general aviation anyway, class C airspace is actually very similar to class Bravo for us. Vancouver, for example, is a class C control zone. And so it's like Bravo airspace in that there are different shelves for far away from the airport versus near. Some go to the surface, some start higher up. And we'll look at these in a little bit more detail on the chart here in a minute. You need an explicit clearance into a class C control zone. Class D is very similar. It's smaller airports, smaller radius, not generally a lot of shelves, but there can be different altitudes and you need, you need clearance to enter class Delta airspace. Class Echo, there can be control zone or just general class Echo airspace. And that's usually at airports without towers. And it's very similar to our class E airspace. It's for, for control and separation of IFR aircraft, but you do not need a clearance when you're VFR to enter class E airspace. They also have a designation for Class F airspace, but it's actually just special use airspace. And the only thing you have to be careful of is whether it's a restricted airspace or an advisory alert area, sort of like in the U.S. where you can have MOAs and alert areas that are a little bit different from restricted areas. So we'll look at an example of that as well. So in order to see all of this airspace, you really need to have sectional and terminal charts available. Of course, you can have paper charts. We chose, I think almost, if not all of us, to have the charts available in ForeFlight. It was about $100 for a year of the Nav Canada databases and charts in ForeFlight. We also paid for GPS databases in the G1000, uh, which you can buy through fly.garmin.com. We had some issues with some of the airplanes, though, where we bought, we had a US database and we had a Canada database. And there isn't a way to switch databases. The databases switch automatically when the date passes and the next database becomes current, but it doesn't switch automatically based on geography. So if we had two databases that began September 10th or whatever, there was no way to switch back and forth on some of the airplanes. The newer NXI G1000s do have that capability, but the older ones didn't have a way to switch databases. So if you're not sure, my suggestion would be to have an America's database, which will give you continuous navigation data and procedures for both the U.S. and Canada. And you can buy those for a month at a time or, or whatever, so you don't have to buy a whole year for $2,000 or whatever it is. So a single month of these should be, you know, $100 or a few hundred dollars or something like that. And that is my suggestion because that's a little bit of a gotcha. So we ended up having to navigate around without the database but we were able to do it just using pilotage and you know good old-fashioned flying skills and the, the charts that we had. It wasn't a huge problem. Would have been more of an issue if we had to be IFR for any reason. And then as part of that subscription in ForeFlight anyway, you get access to a number of other documents that are super helpful. So the legends, for example, which we'll look at in a little more detail here in a second, those are super helpful because some of the symbology on the charts is different and a little bit difficult to decipher if you're not used to looking at it. And then, of course, they have the chart supplement, which is the Canada Flight Supplement. It's completely analogous to the chart supplement, and you can see an example of the kind of data that's in there on the runways, the communications, procedures, and so forth. The AIM is available in there as well. There's some other like phraseology guides and other things that are, that are quite helpful. So I highly recommend subscribing for a month or however long you need to that level of data through your uh, electronic flight bag. So as I mentioned, the, the depiction of airspace on the charts is a little bit different. It's worth spending a minute on. You can see here on the sectional chart, class E control zone looks very similar to what class D looks like in the US. Class E doesn't require any permission to enter, but it is depicted on the airspace and it does sometimes have communication requirements. We'll talk about that in a second. And there you can also see class D and class C terminal areas and control zones. They're depicted with the brackets or the little T's. Uh, so a little bit different depiction. On terminal charts, it's also a little bit different. You can see the gray line there that outlines the terminal control area boundary. And that's an important boundary because it's a, that's class C airspace and you're required to have permission to enter that airspace. So I'll show you how I dealt with that because um, these charts can get quite busy and uh, difficult to decipher. So we'll just go through some examples here. The first example is Revelstoke, which is the equivalent of a non-towered, uncontrolled airfield in the US 
And you can see here, there's no control zone. There's no classy airspace. Uh, there's no tower. There's no air traffic control on the field. And we know that because we don't see the depiction of airspace around the airport. We also look in the CFS and we see under communication, there's no tower. All it has is this ATF. So ATF is an advisory frequency that you are required to use to communicate with other aircraft when you're within whatever distance it says. In this case, it says five nautical miles and 4,500 feet above the surface. So if you are within that zone, you should be talking on the uh, advisory frequency. You can also remotely reach Pacific Radio, which is sort of like their flight service station on 122.375, but you're not required to talk to the flight service station and you're not directing your communications to the flight service station. There are cases at airports like this where there's no mandatory frequency or, or ATF listed. And in that case, there's a standard frequency 123.2. Now, another really interesting difference in Canada is when you're outside the immediate area of an airport, you're supposed to use this en route common traffic advisory frequency to make position reports. And you'll hear people all over the countryside transmitting on 126.7 and making position reports. So, for example, if you were just flying over Revelstoke Airport here, um, proceeding westbound, you might make a position report like en route traffic, Skylane November 584 Lima, Quebec, over Revelstoke 10000, westbound along the river to Sycamuse. It's unusual for US based pilots because we don't make position reports like this, but it's actually quite helpful because, especially in an area like this, geographically, the airplanes tend to be funneled into these valleys. And we had a couple of cases where it was nice to know there were other airplanes around in case we had trouble or Know, to avoid being too close to other airplanes and so forth. We also had a case where we learned some really valuable weather information. A pilot heard us traveling westbound towards the mountains and gave us a report that there was pretty significant mountain wave activity because the winds were quite high over the, over the ridges. And he said, hey, I, I had some pretty bad mountain wave turbulence. You might consider going another way. And that was super nice and helpful of him. We altered our route and went a little bit uh, different way around the mountains. So really, uh, really useful, uh, but important difference in the uh, communication protocol there. So then a slightly larger airport that we visited, Kamloops. And in this case, you can see that it does have a depiction of class E airspace, but there's no tower. So this is a class E control zone. You don't need permission to enter this control zone, but the protocol, as you can see here in the CFS under the comm section, is to communicate and see it has MF, it's a mandatory frequency 125.7, but it says RDO. So when you communicate on this frequency, you're actually directing your communication to Pacific Radio. It's kind of confusing. I believe this is the way it's done in Alaska in some places where there's a flight service station on the field and you call and ask for an airport advisory. So in this case, when we were coming down the river there, we called Pacific Radio, Skyline, November 584, Lima, Quebec, 10 miles north request advisories and Pacific Radio came back and told us they saw us on radar and said, you know, there are two airplanes in the pattern using runway, whatever. And then, you know, we just made reports as we got closer so they could keep tabs on who was where and advise us of other traffic. It's kind of a weird hybrid between a tower and a, a common traffic advisory frequency. So then a slightly larger airport we visited was Kelowna, which you can see here is a class D control zone. And you can see that because on the chart, the airport is surrounded by these little bracket symbols. And then it also has this text CZD to 6,500. So it's a class Delta control zone up to 6,500. Although the shelves, it does have a couple of different shelves and you have to you know, be careful about that depending on which direction you're approaching from. And then if you look under the comm section of the CFS, it has tower. So we will talk to the tower on 119.6, at least during the time the tower is open. If the tower is closed, there's a mandatory frequency. So we talk to uh, Pennington Radio on the tower frequency, which is also the mandatory frequency when the tower is closed. So in this case, the tower is open. We said Kelowna Tower, Skyline November 584 Lima, Quebec. We're 10 west at 3000, landing with information Charlie. And they gave us instructions for how to approach the airport. Uh, in some cases, there are procedures like noise abatement procedures to be followed. 
And we were not that familiar, so they just said, okay, fly towards this bridge and report when you're crossing the bridge. Okay, now you're cleared to enter a right downwind, and now you're cleared to land. Uh, so it's not that different from operating with a normal tower. You just do what they say and ask them in English if you're unclear what they're instructing you to do. And lastly, Vancouver. We didn't actually fly into the Vancouver airport, but we traversed the airspace and we flew around the city a little bit. And it is, uh, it is a little bit intimidating, but once you learn where the airspace is and what it means, it makes it much simpler. And just like any other air traffic control, you can just speak to them in English if you don't know exactly what they're asking you to do or if you don't know how to say exactly what you're asking for. So in this case, class C terminal area um, is depicted with a gray shaded line and then the altitudes are in information boxes here that say, you know, Vancouver terminal 125.2 above 6,500 and below 12,500 because the Bravo airspace starts at 12,500. I found this chart really difficult to interpret until I turned on the aeronautical layer within ForeFlight, which I honestly, I don't normally use, but I just found that it helped me see the boundaries here that I wasn't used to looking for on this type of chart. And so you can see here, if you were approaching from the Northeast, say over Pitt Lake, you would need to communicate with Vancouver Terminal. And depending on your altitude and where you are, you'd need to talk to them at a different point. But you would talk to them, Vancouver Terminal, Skyline November 584 Lima, Quebec, over Pitt Lake at 5,500, transition west over Lions Gate. And Lions Gate is here over Vancouver Harbor. In our case, we actually asked to get low and do a, an orbit or two of the city. And uh, they gave us a squawk. They radar identified us. They coordinated us through the airspace and told us, you know, speeds and altitudes and headings occasionally to separate us, but they, they were very helpful. Okay, and lastly, we've got some special use airspace. And um, this is, it's really not that different from the US. It's just depicted differently. On the left hand side, you can see CYA, which is a alert area. And so you don't need permission to enter, but you know, there may be activity in there that you want to be aware of or avoid. And then on the right, CYR is a restricted area. And that, of course, you cannot go into, or you need to ask permission to see if it's active. All right, so that sort of wraps up airspace. There are some differences, though, in the weather minimums in different types of airspace. And uh, most of them are about your cloud clearance requirements. Uh, I'm not going to go through this whole table, uh, but you can also you can access this in the Canadian Aviation Regulations and also in the AIM but just know that there's some differences in the weather minima. Another important difference is flight plans. Any flight in Canada that is not within 25 miles of the departure airport must have a flight plan. And it's an ICAO flight plan, which is, is now the same flight plan that we use in the US. There's a little bit of additional required information. You can file them with ForeFlight, but you can see there that some of the fields that we might not require in the US are required in Canada. So you need a destination contact and phone number. I believe you have to include your certificate number where you have your personal pilot contact information. But it's fairly straightforward to file these flight plans. Air traffic control can activate them. And so that's also very straightforward. If you're departing from a non-towered field or a field without any air traffic control, you can also call and activate the flight plan. Call and cancel the flight plan, or the flight plan will automatically activate at your time of departure. So you have to be a little bit careful if you file the flight plan and then are delayed, the flight plan will automatically activate. And that can create problems if you are delayed and then you depart and, and don't tell anyone. One of the reasons for this is flight following and radar services are not very common in Canada outside of terminal areas. There are centers in the you know, in the same way there are centers in the U.S., but they really cater to IFR traffic, and flight following is not very, very typically received. So the flight plans are a way to make sure that you arrive where you're supposed to and that search and rescue is launched if you don't arrive. Same as in the U.S., but it's required uh, in Canada. Another important difference is the use of oxygen. The rules are slightly different. Above 10,000 feet, you are required to use oxygen or any part of the flight greater than 30 minutes in duration. And then above 13,000 feet, each person on board must wear supplemental oxygen. So slightly different. Again, make sure you reference the regulations for your specific type of flight, but these are the ones that apply to us. And then uh, there's some differences in terminology. And really, 
These are not that complicated, but it was good to know about these in advance. You could probably figure them out on the fly. Things like this, right? Decimals are pronounced as decimal, not point, like we say in the US. So contact Vancouver Terminal 125 decimal 2. And clearly you'd figure out what that means, but it's just highlighting some of the differences. Leading zeros. So when a single digit runway like runway 7, we would say runway 07 in Canada. The traffic pattern there is called a circuit. Radar contact is said as identified. So you, know, you call the tower when you're 10 miles away or something, they would say, Skyline to member 584 Lima, Quebec. You're identified at 3,000 feet. You know, maintain 3,000, whatever. In airspace, um, we've already talked about some of this. They're called control zones. And then they say at or below a little bit differently. They will say not above. So uh, Skyline November 584 Lima, Quebec, right turn on course approved, not above 3,000. Um, it's just a little bit different if you're not quite expecting that. There is a full phraseology guide online. Um, it's got some useful examples. It talks about how to make position reports and so forth. If you really want to uh, dig into it, you can do that in there. But in general, it's very similar. It's English. Uh, there are just some subtle differences. And again, if you don't understand, you can always just ask. All right, so that is really the, uh, the main differences that we saw and some of, the, some of the procedures that we struggled a little bit with and found a little bit stressful. So I hope you found that helpful. And uh, I welcome your comments. And uh, of course, if you found this video helpful, feel free to like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for joining.